This is episode six of Sisters of Thunder with Kathy Baldock and Yvette Schneider. Kathy just got back from Charlotte, from Pride in Charlotte, and we're going to talk about what she did while she was there. I think we need to start, though, with why living in the West, you go all the way to Charlotte to a Pride event when you could just go to those over here. I guess if I told you I just really wanted really good Carolina barbecue, you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> but I did get Carolina barbecue, but you wouldn't believe me, would you? <laughs> no. So it started several years ago when don't, uh, when uh, don't Ask, Don't Tell was starting to go through the military. And one of my friends, Chris Hain, wanted me to pay attention to this particular person that was on the radio that was seeming to drone on endlessly about his opposition to Don't Ask, Don't Tell in media, in, uh, in Christian conservative media. And his name was Michael Brown. He had a show called um, The Line of Fire, Ask Dr. Brown on, on, uh, on Facebook. And Chris wanted me to engage because although I wasn't as educated on these issues as I am today, I was still pretty, I was doing still pretty well on, um, you know, just being able to be a, a Christian advocate. So I started engaging Michael Brown online, and then all of a sudden Michael Brown decided that he was going to increase his engagement with the gay community in the Charlotte area by going into the Gay Pride event. The year before, in 2010, he had gathered together Christians outside the Gay Pride event on a in a park area or a church area that was adjacent to the gay pride event because the event had been in a private park. So he couldn't march into the event. So he, and it looked like, I saw the video, maybe, you know, 75 to 100 Christians got down on their knees and in prayer circles. I mean, I hate, I don't really mean to make light of this stuff, but some of it is just too much. And because of who he also invited, it was way too much for me is Lou Angle. Right. Yeah. Lou Angle of, you know, Lou Angle. <laughs> well, can't, I, I can't partic- pray without shaking. I right? participated in the call at Qualcomm Stadium back in 2008. So. And you give me another reason yes. to cut off your microphone yet again this week. <laughs> Kick me out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> Yvette, you have much. You still have penance to pay. So, yes, I know Lou Angle well. <laughs> yeah. So Lou Angle had been invited and he was going to be inviting him again the next year. So. So back to that. So he said, you know, now is our year. God has called me in the spirit to reach out and resist the gay agenda. And this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to go into gay pride and I'm going to ask for, he asked for 500 prayers, worshipers, leaders, musicians, and dancers. This sounds crazy to go into gay pride with him because it was now going to be an, uh, up, it would be called Uptown Charlotte out on the streets out of a private park. So more accessible and still without a fee. So he was asking people to go do that. And I thought just as an advocate 3000 miles away, that is a ridiculous proposition to do that. So offensive. I'd been to San Francisco pride, lots of other prides, never to Charlotte. And so what I did was I thought this was going to be my, my grand contribution. I wrote an article online on my blog. I took exactly his mission statement of what he hoped to achieve. I posted it in a blog post, and I said to people, I'm going to keep this open for 30 hours, and you're going to tell me if someone came into your pride event and did this to you, would you feel the love and compassion of Christ? Because his intention was to go into pride with all these Christians and matching T-shirts. Or his stated intention, right? which his, really, I believe the intention is just to draw attention to himself and say, look what I'm doing. That's pretty consistent with his personality. But so was there anyone who said they would have had a positive response to him and his minions showing up? No, I got a hundred, I think it was 146 responses. I posted them all in a post. I addressed it to the people in Charlotte that were possibly thinking of participating in that event to say, okay, this is what your intention is, but there's a big differential in your intention and the results you're going to get. So I'm just going to ask you to consider not participating in this event because as a straight ally and having been to so many events, I knew it would be offensive. So, uh, but that was going to be my grand um, contribution. And then um, one morning I woke up, 10 days before the event, as clear as a bell I heard in my head, 
you are going to Charlotte. Like, I am always struggling for money, and particularly several years ago when I was just starting ministry work, and I had an argument with God, like, I can't possibly go to Charlotte, I can't do that, I don't have the money, and then I thought, well, I'm just going to be very brave, and I'm going to put my request online on my blog, put it out on Facebook, and I was so afraid of the response. I didn't, I mean, I'm telling you the truth here, um, I'm like, actually, when do I not tell the truth, but anyway, um, I was so afraid of failing publicly that I went outside as soon as I posted that, and I went outside to the garage and I loaded up my kayak because I <laughs> thought if I went up to Lake Tahoe without my phone, I couldn't watch myself fail over the next hour. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you can't know, check in. I can't check in. I can't <laughs> see how badly I'm doing. You know, I just thought, oh, well, that's a technique. That's a useful technique. But... While I was getting ready to go, I got my kayak on the car and I came back in and I checked and then I got a phone call within 20 minutes and someone gave me the airfare. Wow. And gave me actually enough airfare, airfare that Lisa Salazar, who was going to be coming down for a, a board meeting during the, the week just preceding that, um, I had enough money to take her with me too. And because she had had some... Um, non-constructive on his part exchanges with Michael Brown online, which I also recorded on my 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 blog page. Um, he's he's particularly horrid in his attitudes, totally uneducated attitudes, and we'll be talking about those again next week. Not his attitudes, but the APA's attitudes, right, um, towards trans people. That I really wanted Lisa to go with me. So I went back there thinking that's all I was going to ever do. I was just going to confront this Christian action. And uh, Lisa and I and two other people, Steve Knight and Andrea White, uh, they, they were the only two in Charlotte that joined us. And we had matching T-shirts. And Lisa was very funny. Lisa drew, she's a graphic artist. And so she drew on her T-shirt the exact replica of the postcard we knew they were handing out, the exact replica. And then right under it, she wrote, you know, I'll take your garbage for you. Because people didn't know that this lovely postcard they were being handed actually pointed them to a reparative therapy site, um, sites that said that they were broken and that homosexuality was a sin. The site, they all wore t-shirts that said, God has a better way. And the site was filled with all anti-gay, you're broken, here's how you need to get fixed stuff. So the postcard was pretty enough, but Lisa would just walk up, she walked up with a big plastic trash bag <laughs> and she would say to people right away, oh, I'll take that postcard from you. And they'd say, oh, no, no, no. And she'd say, well, this is what it say. And they'd just give her the postcard because she didn't want the litter on the street and she wanted an opportunity to tell people who these people were. Right. And so um, they came in with water bottles that Brown says, say, they did say, Jesus loves you, but the water bottles also had the God Has a Better Way website on them, which pointed to all this reparative therapy information. Can you imagine how offensive that was? Of course it's offensive. I went to pride parades back in late 80s, early 90s in L.A., and the Christians would come and tell us, oh, you're going to hell. That's real nice. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't see one person Never. say, please let me be a part of your group. <laughs> Can I join please, your team? I, I, <laughs> you give such a compelling argument. I can't wait. <laughs> My life is so miserable and you look so kind and I loving. Mean, usually I would just go and fight with them myself. Yeah. Because I, imagine I found you would. it so ridiculous. It's like, really, how would I join your team? Yeah. I, I just don't understand how you're you're coming here and you're being so mean and hateful. And I'm going to say, yes, I want a piece of that. Yeah. Well, they they to their credit, they weren't angry and screaming and they came in with these water bottles. And I would, I would, I asked, well, I sat there and counted. Lisa and I counted as they left the venue. We were right across the street, took pictures and counted. So whenever he says there's 400 people, I can show you photos with 176, right? Because I counted. And about a third to a quarter of them were children. So they didn't count. And, you know, if this was such a horrible event, why were those people bringing their children in? I mean, the words used to describe this event were pretty dreadful. It was, you know, walking in the, you know, the, the entryway to hell, not quite in hell, but certainly, you know, in the corridors surrounding it. And so um, we went and we did that. 
And they were only in there for about an hour and a half. And my account of it is absolutely stunning because some really, you know, pretty miraculous things were happening on our team. And then um, when they left, I decided to position myself in front of the street preacher preachers. I had never done that at a Pride event. I had, you know, gone and worked with Freedom in Christ in their booth or ridden on their floats with them singing, you know, techno pop praise songs in a orange choir robe. That that's way so much more fun. But I had never like totally confronted the street preacher. So what's it like to stand oh my face goodness. to face with a street pe preacher? Because I saw those pictures from yeah. this past pride where you're literally face to face with this guy while he's spewing his hateful words. So what does that feel like to have that directed right to your face? Well, I've come to the place where I understand, well, first of all, they're not God and they're not even speaking the message of God. And this is their own stuff. I would love to have those guys, you know, get group therapy, group counseling sessions, <laughs> you know, a cut rate, because they really, there's something going on in there that is not normal. They're, they don't think they sin, which is really an amazing thing. They have no concept that even what they're doing is wrong. And they will actually tell you they no longer sin. Oh, one of my old pastors told me he no longer sinned. And then we found out about all the financial indiscretions. So, Well, those are indiscretions. That's a sin. Yeah, that's right. They're indiscretions. <laughs> they're illegal, but they're not sin. <laughs> they're not abominations. <laughs> no, they're not they're abominations. They're not abominations. <laughs> so I guess there's grades of sin. But I think I watched them really bother lots of people. And I'll address that afterwards, but they don't bother me. And I think part of it is is because I really am built to do this, that this is this is the job I have. I'm an advocate for the LGBT community. And it means a lot of things, but one of the things it means is that when my gay and trans friends are just so beaten up by all of this stuff, I can still stand. And um, to some degree, I felt like I was taking it as a diversion. So the, I, this time in particular, over the, all the five years that I've done this now, I've gone back every year, and Brown's groups haven't shown up. He's sent his students in one year to do a, like an innocuous little friendly survey, which now after seeing the Ray Comfort stuff, we know how people manipulate surveys to get you to say what they want you to say. And then those answers and the video were completely used to shame the gay community. They're very selective surveys. And then another year he came in by himself with another person. But that action, that's gone. That, it's a, it was a ridiculous action. And he never came back. But I Well, I would imagine that if you have some guy yelling at you, then it just doesn't give him the opportunity to yell at anyone Actually, else. That is absolutely what happens. So it's so disconcerting to them, and I can see it, when I stand in front of them and I take it and I don't react, it, it like bothers their rhythm, right? It just breaks that rhythm of they're on a roll. And a few of them, I'm pretty tenacious, <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a frenzy. They get themselves yes. worked up into a frenzy. And I actually went to their website and looked at some of oh, one right. of their conferences. And it's basically, oh, anyone can sit behind a keyboard. Anyone can be on their computer. But we're the real warriors. We're the ones who go out there. And then they shame each other into going out. Like, you're not doing enough. You're not. We're not doing enough. And yep. we're ugly in God's eyes if we don't go out there and yell at people. <laughs> it's really... It, it kind of blows your mind if you look at their website. They're, they're interesting. So right after they had a conference, I sent the website to Yvette, and it's pretty stunning stuff. But these are the people that do go out to Pride events. This particular group, they're kind of a loosely knit group, and there's 28 of them from what I understand across the country. But Charlotte area has the reputation, and I only know this from vendors that go from Pride to Pride, since you know I wouldn't be a a good opinion of who are the worst because I don't go to all the prides, but the vendors often do. And the vendors have told me that the worst street preachers they see are right there at Charlotte Pride. So there's this band and they kind of live from 
just south of Raleigh down to Rock Hill, South Carolina. And remember a few years ago when there were those two pastors, I think one was in Maiden, I can't remember where the other one was, but they had the fabulous ideas. One of them thought the best solution for a gay child was to punch him in the stomach. And, you know, the demons would come out of him. And the other one thought his fabulous solution was to round up all the gay people, put them behind a fence, and airdrop food in until they died out. <laughs> well, they're from right there. They're nice. The, yeah. <laughs> so it's a pretty interesting area. And, you know, if we ever got totally bored, I could tell you the conversation I had on the phone with that pastor because I called him too. But if I can break, break that frenzy and distract them, and set them back on their heels because they're not getting to me, I see that as productive. And so it's not the only thing I do. We've all participated. We great participants this year. Bo and Michael and Jalisa and Hadassah and Donna and, and Steve. And uh, we, just, we just really stood. And if I'm forgetting anybody, I'll catch them in my head. Um, we just stood and did great work interacting with the Pride Festival goers, and we gave out stickers, and um, thank you to the contributors for contributing significantly so that we could give out 8,000 stickers, and the stickers pointed to a, a, a resources page on my website for open and affirming churches, Bible reconciliation, uh, book resources, everything that, the questions I always get asked, so I can say to somebody, go to these, there is a church that welcomes you. But a lot of the work we were doing this year, Donna had a great idea that she had a, the pictures are wonderful. She, she was like, to me, the rock star. She, on our planning calls, she said, how about we get a banner as big as their banners? And we just say to people that God loves you and that we'll give them prayer and hugs. So that was a, a really interesting turnabout because here was this, just like the street preacher's banners, this beautiful big banner that was standing right next to them. And during the parade, when they were walking the streets in a, in a concentrated area with their big banners, Donna just tailed him. I mean, she had sweat dripping down the back of her shorts. She had this big half semicircle of sweat from just staying on them and carrying this heavy banner. What a rock yeah. star. But the pictures of that... The dichotomy of those pictures to me is so fabulous. And so that's actually part of, like I, I just wrote a blog post, it will be up by the time this airs. I'm seeing huge changes. I'm seeing for the first time um, the LGBT community and their allies, because it's not just gay people that go to gay, to, no, to gay pride. No. <clears throat> they are fighting back but they're fighting back differently. They're fighting back with verses. And I've stood in that spot for five years. And we all kind of looked at each other during the day and saying, like, are you feeling it? Are, are you seeing what's happening here? The people aren't just fighting back with, you can't tell me what to do. God loves me and God doesn't judge. The, the conversation has like taken this way up elevation of ordained pastors that are gay, um, former youth leaders, preachers' kids, kids in Bible schools, LGBT allies, people that have really good Bible training and understand the Bible, engaging them. And these guys can't engage on that level because they don't Because they don't know the Bible they don't on know that the Bible. level. They don't know the Bible. So to watch people engaging with the street preachers, oh yeah, there was, a, believe me, there was tons of anger, but asking really good questions and standing up for themselves, it was such a noticeable difference. And um, I didn't think that I'd be seeing it this soon. It's switched, it's totally switched. Well, the resources for education are out there. Huge, huge change. There are, you can go online, mm -hmm. you can read books, it's everywhere now. So there really is no excuse not to be educated on these issues, yes. whether they're Bible issues or history issues or mental health issues. All the information is at our fingertips. And so it, so as I wrote in this post, I said, it's, I, and I, you know, perfect storm. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's 
synergy of all the moving pieces have finally moved and clicked and the cogs are just like click, 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 they're coming into place. But it's this tipping point that has, ha has occurred and really unless you've watched it and unless you have seen the changes or the not changes over the years, this one was so radical. And to see, so I'm sure marriage equality has empowered people and given them confidence. I mean, you could see that in people saying, you know, you can't tell me I'm married or I'm going to get married or showing their wedding rings and saying, you know, I've been married, I've been with this person for 20 years and I'm finally married or, you know, um, yelling at the street preachers like you can't do anything about it now, I'm married. And so that was absolutely there. The conversations or the boy, some of those, some of the folks that were arguing, it was, it got heated. Some of it got really heated. Um, if they were with me, I would have not preferred our group to engage that way. None of us ever do. Um, but they were just festival goers and people were angry. They're angry at this having happened in their celebration year after year after year. And they're fighting back. Well, I think it's so interesting that you have these conservative or evangelical Christians who talk about harassment or persecution when every single year they show up to the pride events. Yeah. And who's outside their churches passing out flyers that say the same sort of thing, how wrong their church teachings are, how wrong, however, they've chosen to worship is. Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen anything like that happen, not even close to that level of har harassment ever. And so I think if people don't go to these pride events and they don't understand, if they've never seen that level of intensity, I don't think they can imagine <clears throat> just how bad it is. It is, it is, it would feel like somebody punching you in the throat so overwhelmingly shocking, you know, it's just, it, it's so overwhelming that people that are standing there saying that they're speaking for God with a book that, and, and, you know, in case you should ever miss that it's a Holy Bible, it's printed very big on there with neon letters that they're holding the Holy Bible. And they, um, what is coming out of their mouth is vile. And what they are saying to people, you would never imagine a human saying that to another human being and standing for God and saying that. And I think the people that are listening to this, parents of gay kids, um, people in the churches that are, are wondering, um, you know, about this conversation, you've got to realize that GLBT people have been subjected to this kind of venom and torture, verbal torture, for a very long, for decades. And to see it switch, it's, it, it could l look like to someone from the outside that they're not seeing it, but we all saw it because we've all done this for years in this place, on this corner, with these same street preachers. They keep adding new, younger, more um, corrupted blood. But we saw the shift. And I started thinking about it. So I, you know, so I see marriage equality has changed it. People are fighting back with a confidence. Um, people are saying, I've gone to Bible school. So that's part of their confidence. But you also see a lot of parents. And people were dragging up their parents to me that were with them, saying, oh, this is the author of that book I gave you, mom, dad. This is her. And then the other radical difference that we see is the number of churches participating. It, it is a shocking increase. So when I was in, uh, so I was first started going to Gay Pride in San Francisco, I think 2007, and... At that time, Freedom in Christ Evangelical Church, led by Pastor Maria Caruana and her crew, they had been in the gay pride parade with the float for several years. And when they started, they were the only church in the parade, so much so that she's told me when they rolled down the street in their float and they got in front of the crowds, the crowds would kind of, they didn't know what to do. They would go, <gasps> like, <gasps> 
what is this? What is this? <laughs> like, are you going to yell at us? Um, how did you get in this parade? What are you doing here? And now they've been doing it for well over a decade. And when I first went to Gay Pride in even this little town in our burg of Reno, I think in 2008 as well, only Light of the Soul, uh, United Church of Christ with, uh, with Pastor Denise Cordova was in the parade. And this year I led the Nevada Inclusive Clergy for, for equality too. It was called NICE. Um, and we led 12 churches in our town. And in Charlotte Pride, there were 13 churches in Charlotte. And yeah. I think there's 30 affirming churches in the area. So all of these changes are happening. And if you're not kind of like on the streets, on the ground listening, and here's another encouragement. If you're just sitting in a community sort of closeted and you don't think anything is changing, you say, okay, I've got the right now to marry, and I don't see it changing. It's not changing. I am telling you. It is changing, and it's changing. I think we're going to get to the point where the people in the pews, those parents, those friends, those young millennials, they are not going to tolerate um, non-inclusion or non-consideration of their gay friends. I mean, I'm not saying the churches should throw the doors open wide and let everybody in. I'm all for considered conversation discernment processes about this, education, thinking about it, talking about it, but at least talking about it. And I think the people in the pews are going to force it. Yeah, for sure. So you talked about seeing people, LGBT people, their friends, allies, families, standing up and arguing intelligently. Yes. And not just yelling back. You've talked about more and more churches coming. What else, if anything else, did you see? What was your biggest takeaway from this year? That the power shift has completely changed. That you won't, uh, that if, if a person like Brown tried to do his antic, because that's what I call it. He, he would call it a, um, a compassionate move. If he tried to do something like that, it would never be received well. Because now there are Christians. And I'm, I'm going to resist using those real Christian and true Christian terms because people use that. No. I think there are Christians that are not for equality and inclusion. And I think there are Christians that are for it because what we believe about this issue is not what makes us a Christian. Right. You know, it's faith in Jesus Christ and seeing him as the reconciler to God and understanding death and resurrection. That's what makes you a Christian. Because what if people in the 1700s, there were Christians there and they didn't get faced with this question and issue. So I'm not going to go into the true Christians and the real Christians, but what we're seeing is we are seeing wonderful examples of Jesus Christ showing up at Pride events now. And people, I, I had very few people this year say, when I went to hand them a sticker, because I wear a, a shirt that says, hurt by church, get a straight apology. And we even talked about, like, that shirt has got to change now, because we've... We've moved so we've, far beyond right? that. We've yeah. seen, how did that happen so quickly? So... I, so what I'm seeing are wonderful examples of Christians showing up and people fighting for themselves, and n very few people are now surprised that a Christian is there. When I first went, it was almost like I had to say when I went to hand someone a sticker or a flyer or go talk to them or hug them or do anything, I had to, I, when I would move to them, they would say, oh, no, no, like... You're not coming near me. And I said, no, 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 I'm one of the good ones. I I'm had friendly. to only I only had to do that once this year. Just once. So people are expectant and comfortable with this space now, which is great, where the LGBT community and Christianity is coming together because I will tell you. The absolute, I mean, I'm probably in an odd, I, know, I acknowledge I'm in an odd spot, but the bulk of my friends are LGBT Christians. There's just no doubt about it. You know, the bulk of my Facebook friends, the bulk of my actual friends, the, the, the most intimate people around me 
are LGBT Christians. So we're finally at a place where it isn't shocking to say that you're gay and a Christian. No. Whereas before, it seemed like that wasn't even possible. You never saw anyone who admitted being gay and a Christian. Well, Justin Lee tells a story, and I'm going to get some of my numbers wrong. But when he first Googled gay and Christian because he was trying to reconcile his faith, I think it would have been 12 years ago when he started a blog. So this is before GCN, because I think GCN might be 10 years old now. As I said, I'm getting some of the numbers wrong. No, it can't be just 10 years old, because I've been going to their conference for 10 years. So this could have been maybe 14 or 15 years ago when uh, he Googled, when we didn't even know what to Google meant. He Googled gay and Christian, and I think he said he got two to 300 hits. And when I came back from a conference when he said that, and that had to be about two or three years ago, and I Googled it, there were 16 million hits. And... So 15 years ago, nobody could imagine you could be gay and Christian. My own part of my testimony of this being involved is when I met gay people, I sat in my head for five or six years never, never imagining that there was a gay Christian. And now it's changed. Yeah. So is there anything else that you want to add about your time well, the parade, um, the post will be up. I'm going to encourage if you're sitting in a church and you haven't, you're afraid of having this conversation with your leadership because you think this is too soon or they're not ready for it or the shift is several years down the road. I'm telling you, we are at the tipping point now. Statistically, you know, so the tipping point is defined as when 20% of a group becomes strongly for, strongly for something. So we may say, yeah, marriage equality is at 58 or 68%, whatever it is, doesn't matter because it's here, or where people are, are, are inclusion for churches. The actual thing, the actual definition of a tipping point is when 20% of the people are strongly for something there is no chance then it will ever go back. And it works the same way. Do I have a cell phone and a house phone? Do I use a laptop or a PC? Everything works this way. When 20% of a group are strongly for something, it doesn't return again. So it just tips. And you may not be seeing it in your community. But I will tell you, I can I can promise you from not just the conversations I'm in behind the scenes and the mail I get, but I can tell you from standing on the streets of Charlotte at a gay pride event, at the same gay pride event, with essentially the same people on either side of this equation for the last five years, this thing has tipped strongly. And so... If you are thinking of having this conversation with the leadership of your church, it is not too soon. It is the time. Get educated. And I'm going to give the list of books that I always give. I actually think mine is a good first. I'm tied with Justin Lee's Torn, I think. Justin Lee's Torn kind of opens up the conversation in a person's head to say, oh my goodness, this person really did not realize he was gay and Christian. So Justin Lee's Torn... My book, Walking the Bridges Canyon, Matthew Vine's book, God and the Gay Christians, David Gushy's Changing Our Minds, and then the one if you want to have some great inter interchange with uh, your leaders, Bible, Gender, Sexuality by James Brownson. And that's a really nice set of books to start this conversation, but the, really the bottom line is this thing is tipped. I can see it. It was a surprise to me. And it's time. It's just time to have the conversations. Well, this was a great conversation, Kathy. I think everyone would agree that it was very interesting to hear about Charlotte. A lot of that I didn't know huh. yet. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't realize the numbers of Christians who are out there yes. who are pro-LGBT yeah. and supportive and allied. And uh, nor did I realize how educated 
LGBT groups and their parents and allies are, Mm -hmm. that they can effectively shut down (laughs) the street preachers. Frustrate them would be a great, (laughs) frustrate them. Yes. So yeah, this was a great conversation. Well, thanks. So thank you for sharing with us. Again, this is Sisters of Thunder. I'm Yvette Schneider. And I'm Kathy Baldock. Join us next week. Next week. Bye. Bye.